If you grew up as I did with a wedge form Amiga, you may recall that pinch of envy you had when seeing your friends with their specked out big box Amigas. The desktop and tower Amiga models had a variety of really great upgrade options open to them. RTG graphics, CD-ROMs, network adapters, emulation cards, just to name a few. Many of these were simply unavailable to Wedge Amigas, or if they were, they came with a string of limitations. Now in 2019, the Vampire range of accelerators helps to bridge that capability gap. The goal of this project is to incorporate as much of that big box Amiga performance as possible into an Amiga 500's tiny case, enhancing its base configuration with a CD-ROM, RTG graphics, a powerful CPU, tons of RAM, and an internal hard drive. And all without altering its original aesthetic. A serious challenge you may think, but not as difficult as you might expect. So let's hop to it and build the ultimate Amiga 500. For our build, internal storage will come in the form of a compact flash card. And to make this build a little nicer and a step closer to the big box Amiga experience, we will install a CD-ROM drive as well. Now Commodore did release a bulky external CD-ROM for the 500, but these are expensive and cumbersome. Call it stylistic bias if you want, but for me a CD-ROM always belongs on the inside. So an internally mounted CD-ROM will be our target here. The centerpiece of this build is of course the Vampire Accelerator. And this card really packs a punch with 128 megabytes of fast RAM, an 80 megahertz CPU, an onboard IDEA controller, and an SPI expansion port. If that isn't enough to impress you, it also has a built-in RTG graphics card. The digital video output is delivered over this connector, which works with standard HDMI monitors. Our networking capability will come courtesy of this inexpensive ENC 28J60 Ethernet module. It has a supported driver which you can download from the Apollo Teams wiki page. You can pick these up from Amazon or eBay or a variety of online shops very cheaply, but it is important to be sure that you have the 3.3 volt version. The 5 volt variants are more common and won't work with the Vampire. So with all the components in hand, the next step is to complete some prerequisite preparation steps. It is essential to have these done. Replace the original capacitors. On the Amiga 500 Plus, the original battery should also be removed. Purchase a newer or more powerful power supply. And optionally, purchase a SCART to HDMI converter for viewing ECS screens on HDMI monitors. The importance of replacing old capacitors should not be underestimated. While they don't leak, causing motherboard damage like on the Amiga 600, they do dry out. Poorly functioning and non-functional capacitors will impact the stability of the system. It also gives you the opportunity to reorient this capacitor here, which otherwise pushes up against the Vampire once installed. While not necessarily a problem, having it lay horizontally instead means you can push the Vampire into place without worrying about damaging the capacitor underneath. I also took the opportunity to inspect the board for any leakage from the battery before installing a socket for a replaceable battery. Next is the preparation of the CD-ROM. To minimise the amount of change I would need to do to the case, we are going to use a slot load CD-ROM. A simple slit cut into the side of the case will be far more elegant than cutting a hole for a tray. Placing the drive into the top of the case I can see there's more than enough room for the drive as well as cabling. Now to make the cut I got help from a colleague who could operate this big machine here. After measuring everything up, the machine was programmed to cut the slip precisely, and the result looks fantastic. My colleague did a really good job. Thanks, Urus. He also cut some holes into the back of the case for the HDMI and Ethernet ports. Now, connecting the CD-ROM is just a matter of some inexpensive adapters that convert the Vampire's 44-pin IDE connector into a micro SATA connector. I used two adapters for this, converting traditional IDE to SATA and a second adapter to convert to micro SATA. The cabling will also supply power from the Vampire's IDE connector. This is why a newer power supply is important. The original power supply could probably handle the task, but for this build we are going to use a beefier power supply. It provides additional current which is helpful given the upgrades we are adding. Finding connectors for the Ethernet and digital video at the rear of the Amiga is tricky. Most of the adapters I could find would sit in the way of the floppy drive. I did find a solution in the end by way of this strange Ethernet cable. Perhaps customising cabling here is better. Connecting the Ethernet module to the Vampire is quite straightforward. You can use these common JTAG programming cables. I have a previous version of the Vampire which does require a custom cable to connect the Ethernet module. The Apollo Team's wiki contains instructions on how to do this and it really isn't too hard. Installing the Vampire card is quite simple. The original CPU needs to be removed first and the Vampire installed in its place. 
There are some pins on the bottom of the car which slide into the CPU slot and care should be taken to ensure that the pins line up correctly with the socket. To bring the Ethernet and digital video to the connectors at the rear of the Amiga, we are going to use some short Ethernet and HDMI cables. Fixing the CD-ROM at the top of the case can be done with the help of some silicon-based glue. I tried industrial grade double-sided tape first to make sure that the CD-ROM was properly lined up with the slot. Thankfully everything is positioned perfectly. With the Amiga fully assembled, we can put our new configuration to the test, and boy does it fly. It hardly seems possible to exaggerate just how fast the Vampire is. This is for sure the fastest 500 in town. Graphically heavy web pages are no trouble at all. And demos are satisfyingly smooth as well. Even some of the games that would make an 060 crawl are butter smooth. MPEG videos are silky smooth too thanks to a vampire optimized version of the Reva video player. Even though benchmark programs are not the most reliable way to measure an Amiga's real world performance, curiosity will quickly drag you to trying a few out. Yep, call me now. It isn't hard to see why owners of the vampire accelerator cards love them so much. They deliver raw 68k performance never seen before in an Amiga 500. And for the mere price of 360 euros, it's no wonder that these cards sell out fast. It certainly makes those expensive second-hand 060 accelerators look greatly overpriced and underwhelming. So that's all for now. Thanks for watching. <laughs>